um, that number one, Charter Rights and Freedoms is the supreme law of the Corporation of Canada. It's the supreme law, there's no law higher. It's it, it's the top dog. And then it goes on to say that it only applies to the government. So if the Charter and Rights and Freedoms only applies to government and it's their supreme law, how on earth could any subordinate act ever apply to anything other than the government as well? It can't. It's superseded by the Charter and Rights and Freedoms. And we know damn well, we've been saying for years, we know the statutes only apply to the government. And people try to make faulty arguments in court that uh, don't really prove anything and then, you know, they wind up in jail or getting charged the whole nine yards. So, uh, I'm not bother going to bother with any proofs because we already know most of this stuff. Uh, and that is that when you walk into court and they're having a hearing for the person, what they're doing is they're usually charging somebody under the Highway Traffic Act or they're charging somebody with income tax evasion or not filing taxes. Those are the two biggies, I think, with free men, so we should probably stick with those. Now, you probably notice, and again, here's another proof, uh, is that the birth certificate, which is your receipt, is the only document that you have that has the government's signature on it. They sign it and it's sent to you. Everything else has your signature on it. And what that means is the birth certificate proves that the government owes a debt to you in, or an obligation to you in some way. Every other piece of ID where your signature is on there proves that you owe an obligation to the government of some kind. So what they're doing uh, is when they're getting you to or convincing you you need a driver's license to go out and drive. You know, come down and fill out an application and go for a road test and if you're competent and therefore probably bondable, we'll, we, we can, we'll, we'll underwrite for you and uh, we'll, we'll give you this nice little license right here that for, uh, for, for no other <coughs> explanation necessary, it actually creates a public servant title for you. So now that you're a public servant, when you're getting pulled over on the highway, license and registration, you know, you know, oh, okay, well, here's my driver's license. Well, what you gave him is proof that you were just basically acting as a public servant. Statutes apply to public servants, period. Okay, so you can get out of the, the I'm not engaged in commerce argument, you can get out of all those kind of arguments. Because all they're claiming is that you were performing some function of government when they pulled you over because you gave them a license that identified you as an agent of the government. He's a superior officer. That's why when they say, you, you ha you're required to obey me, well, they're right. Absolutely they're right. They're a superior officer, all the way up to the courts, period. All they have to do is get you to admit that you're performing a function of government, which government issue ID proves. It doesn't but that's the presumption that it creates. And I've talked about how presumptions rule in court because we don't rebut the presumptions properly, right? And then when you go into the court file after three years of fighting the government and filing all sorts of nonsense and crap and gibberish, and you actually look in the judge's file, there's one thing in there. And that's the complaint made against a public servant. That's it, that's the only thing the judge actually sees. And we're gonna get into that with some of the court stuff later on after this is all, after everyone gets their, their head wrapped around the whole concept of that. So same, okay. Uh, Taxes. Who owes taxes? Tax right? Public servants. Public servants. And what created the, uh, the taxpayer? Social Your application for a social insurance number. So anytime you use that social insurance number to sign up for a job, a bank account, or use that number anywhere else, it identifies you as an agent of the government. And government can tax their own employees and no one else. Why do you think social insurance numbers are optional on bank accounts? And yes, you better believe they are. It even says optional right beside it. They don't force you to do it. The benefit of having a social insurance number is interest on your bank account. What is it, 0.00002% right now, I think, right? Okay, it's nothing. But everybody hears that word, oh, interest. Oh, I don't want to lose out on a little bit of interest I could be getting, right? And that's why we've known for years that if you don't want a social insurance number on your account, you just tell them you want a non-interest bearing account, period. I've asked them that and they said no. Well, yeah, tell them put it in writing. Yeah, they say all sorts. Yeah, they, all, they say all sorts of nonsense. So. Yeah, a lot of bank policy runs contrary to the Bank Act. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's not even their policy. Um, I, I have yet to see an application where it doesn't say optional right on the sheet. So. 
um, or go to a different bank. I had no problems at Steinbeck Credit Union. I've never had a problem at Royal Bank of Canada, uh, TD. I mean, I've taken my social trust number off my bank accounts I think 12 years ago was when I first did that because that was my first suspicion back then of something was wrong with the whole thing. So that's very simple. So either way, anything that they're trying to charge you with, uh, doesn't matter what it is, they've gotten you to produce some type of ID that identifies you as a public servant, period. And public servants have to obey their rules and regulations because the government underwrites the damages that public servants cause if they do cause any damage. And so we kind of touched, up, uh, touched on liability and uh, uh, assuming full liability and liability issues on one of the previous, well, I think at the end of the last class or something like that, where basically if, some, if, if I'm assuming liability for somebody else's actions, I'm going to want to control what they do to limit the liability. And that's where limited liability comes from. So we should never be afraid of, of, of assuming full liability for our own actions, right? Because then you can get into the whole excuse, well, if I'm assuming full liability for my actions, and I never intentionally cause harm, I really can't ever be held accountable for anything, right? Because even unintentionally causing harm is not causing harm. You didn't intend to do that, it just kind of happened, you know? I walked by and I accidentally bumped something, then a ladder fell down and something else happened and someone across the street got hit with a paint can. Well, I didn't actually intend to do that. So you're not really liable. So liability issues. So the government, because they offer limited liability to all their public servants, they want you to, and also they want to be able to charge us with all these infractions and <coughs> charge the, uh, the person here and run up a, a nice big uh, debt that's, uh, that's good for them. So they want us all to be public servants, and that's exactly what they've done. So when you walk into, uh, into summary convictions court, it's, it's not real court. It's actually like an internal tribunal for the Canadian government. We know that. People have been talking about it for years, but we really couldn't prove it, right? And I never used to like to make statements that I had to prove, but I'm kind of finding now that presumptions actually do work really well because that's all they do in their world. And my presumption stands unless they rebut it. Are they ever going to try to rebut any of this stuff? No, they always are completely silent. In fact, in five years, I've never had one reply to any affidavit I've ever sent to the government. None. Believe me, you're going to be pretty safe. They never reply to affidavits. Because any counter affidavit, if you took it into a court of record, would be perjury on their part, and they can't prove shit. They can't prove a thing. So, and they don't ever try to prove a thing. That's why you go to summary convictions, where, let's compare the differences between Queen's Bench and summary convictions. Queen's Bench, you've got an injured party who makes a filing to the court to bring another party in that owes them something. Right? Summary convictions, what do we got? Presumed jurisdiction where you have to enter a plea. Those two courts don't sound at all the same. So obviously there's got to be some big differences in what's going on. That's why they need to drag you in there, literally. Usually handcuffed. Usually have to have been beaten pretty severely the whole nine yards. Uh, but I will tell you, the only time I actually was not beaten when I was dragged out of my car was when I refused to give a name or a driver's license. That was the only time they were ever really nice to me. You know, sir, are you going to get out of your car now? I said, well, I guess so. I said, you just smashed my window out. I said, you're probably just going to drag me out next physically, aren't you? Now, you better believe it. It's like, all right, right, I don't think you will, but whatever. I just got out. And they're like, okay, hands behind the back. And I just said, no. I said, you can handcuff my hands in front of me. Okay, okay, yeah, that's not a problem. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they've never done that to me before. Usually I'm screaming with three of them on top of me as they're trying to break my arm, right? And I will, like, I'd like to add that I've never actually done anything <laughs> wrong. So that just has a bad habit of happening to me. Um, so yeah, I, didn't, I refused to produce a name. I, did, I refused to give them any ID. And I actually did have a, pri a provincial plate on my truck at, at the time, which doesn't mean anything, right, at all. And we can get into that kind of stuff later on as well. But uh, that was the time where, you know, they handcuffed me. And I said, oh, I said, hang on, this is my concrete finishing hand. I said, you, you got that on there a little tight. Loosen it up a bit. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. No, no, you know, they loosen it up, and they're all nice. And then they asked, you know, they still threw me in jail for four days, but they sure as hell didn't beat me. And they usually love to do the old, you know, quit resisting as they're trying to get you to use your own hand to touch the back of your head. They love that one. Yeah, stop resisting faster than a DJ talks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So that, that was one thing I did notice, and again, uh, the other incidents we, incident we had recently were uh, one of our friends was pulled over and detained uh, by police for two hours for having no license plate at all, just his private plate, would refuse to produce any kind of a driver's license or any ID of any kind that would identify him as something they have jurisdiction over. They wouldn't dare touch him at all, period. 
And this is the guy that had like uh, had had a, his shotgun with him and his rifle. He was going to go outside the city uh, hunting and uh, a knife on his belt, you know, the camo, the whole nine yards, and they they wouldn't touch this guy. They ended up towing his truck home, but then we sued them, and they've never done that since. So, um, if they had the jurisdiction to beat you without producing any ID of any kind, they would have done it on both those occasions because they really like doing that. So we know that any form of ID that you get from the government that has your signature on it is bad. You do not want that because that identifies you as somebody who's applied for a benefit from the government, which is to become a public servant where the government assumes all liability for your actions. And that forces you to have to <coughs> obey statutory codes. Because if the government's assuming liability for your actions, they want to make sure you're not doing anything really stupid. And if you do, they'll drag you into their tribunal and they will correct you. They'll correct your actions. And then off to corrections you go. Right? It's pretty, it's pretty simple, really, when you boil it right down. Um, so where are we going to go with this? I can't remember today. Uh, okay. We could probably even address this question now. So if you're dragged into summary convictions, actually, uh, you know what? I like to uh, talk about the courts as well, too. Uh, a lot of times people are talking about court, you know, provincial court this, provincial court that, the whole nine yards. And uh, people don't realize that there's vast differences between the types of court they hold at the provincial courthouse, right? And the best way to explain it is the same way that you visit a food court at the mall. You walk into the mall, there's a food court, right? And they have five or six different restaurants all in a row. Subway, you know, uh, one of those really disgusting Chinese ones where they never wash all the, you know, the equipment, uh, you know, A&W or whatever they have there, right? It's a food court. So they got six or seven different restaurants there that are, have nothing to do with one another. They don't trade food in the kitchen. They don't swap customer information. They're just independent and strictly their own jurisdiction. That's what's going on at the courthouse. How many of you have been down to the provincial courthouse? You walk in. And they got, you know, uh, wicket window 100A, 100B, 100C, 100D, 100E, 100F, right? And they've got these different windows where you walk up and you basically place your order, which is filing a lawsuit or responding to charges or doing whatever you're there to do. So they've obviously all these different, otherwise they just have one window. You know, Dur blanket jurisdiction. We just handle everything right here. Well, they don't. There's different jurisdictions for everything. 100D is summary convictions down at the provincial court. So you're going down to the provincial court to then go to the summary convictions window. And that's where all the problems start to come from. Um, and then we're going to also get into why you should just never go to the courtroom at all, because really a courtroom is for nothing but public servants. The fact that you're there is enough to go on, that you're a public servant, otherwise you wouldn't be there, because it's not their responsibility to teach you who you are. So if you're too dumb to know or you haven't figured it out, I shouldn't say the word dumb because we were never taught this. You know, these people just think they're brilliant because, oh, look at how stupid these guys are. They come in here and they have no idea what's going on. It's like, well, yeah, that, that's kind of the whole point of your 12 years of education. You made sure that we're so stupid and incompetent that when we come in here, we can't speak your language at all. And that's what it is. It's just ignorance. It's just, it's ignorance. And it's not even really our faults. It is, but again, it's not. Um, so that's why, again, that's why we're all here, trying to educate ourselves. So now we know what the courtroom is. Um, and why we usually get some of the responses we get when we go up into summary convictions and try to say, well, yeah, I'm here as the administrator of that legal person. And, ah! You know, they freak out because that's not where you're supposed to be. That's not a forum for administrators or shareholders or directors or anything. That's for public servants only. It's an internal tribunal. So we've basically are along the lines of now that we should be shutting that down shortly after receiving the ticket or the charge or whatever else we're doing. In fact, we're even giving, we're given time. You got three weeks before you got to show up and do anything with this. No, I want to deal with it right now. No, 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 you got three weeks. No, I'm going down to the courthouse right now. I mean, I've done that. Uh, no, I'm, no, I'm going down there right now. I said, no, you, you, like, you got three weeks. Just wait three weeks. You can't even go down there and deal with it right yet kind of thing, right? Well, they're giving us time to actually uh, to, to remedy the situation long before it actually has to go to a hearing or court or a plea or anything else, any other kind of nonsense. So that's what's going on in summary convictions court, and that's the problem everybody's having, obviously, because every time you're charged with anything, it's in summary convictions court. They obviously have no claim withstanding in fact against you, or you'd be in Queen's Bench, where they actually hear matters that have an actual claim, right? 